This is Matthew Cratter from Trady University, and today I want to talk about how the U.S. government is in the process of defaulting on its debts. This is an answer to Vinnie Marbach's question in my YouTube comments, what do you mean by experiencing its first global sovereign default? So we're going to talk about what those words mean. It's very important that you understand what's happening right now at a macro, a macroeconomic level, because if you don't, you're going to make the wrong financial investment decisions for your family. And it's especially essential if you hold any U.S. treasuries in your portfolio to understand what is going on here. So we first have to def discuss what is a default. And in order to discuss that, we have to talk about government bonds. Government bond is just when you lend money to your government or another government in exchange for quarterly or semi-annual interest payments, and then repayment of your principal, your initial investment at maturity. The most common and most liquid U.S. Uh, government bonds that exist today are what are called U.S. Treasuries. They're issued by the U.S. Treasury for that reason, and they're just U.S. government federal bonds. And these have been really since the U.S. went off the gold, the gold standard in 1971, U.S. Treasuries have been the global reserve asset. Central banks, foreign governments worldwide store a large portion of their savings. In other words, their FX reserves, their profits from international trade in U.S. treasuries. In addition, sovereign wealth funds, pensions, insurance companies, endowments, corporations, if you have a pension or any sort of retirement plan, it's quite likely that it is holding U.S. treasuries. U.S. treasuries come in many different uh, shapes and forms. They have different maturities going from one month T-bills all the way out to 30-year bonds. And we can see here that the most recent interest rates go from somewhere uh, bet uh, between 0.2% uh, all the way up to about 2.5% at the long end of the curve. So what is, a, what is a default on a government bond? A default is when a government misses one of those quarterly or semi-annual interest payments. Another form of default would be where the government fails to pay you back the full amount of principal that it owes you. So if you invest $100,000 in government bonds, if the government misses an interest payment, that would constitute a hard default. And if it fails to pay you back that full $100,000, that would also be a hard default. There are countries like Argentina, which have had a difficult time over the past few decades. They, you've probably heard about Argentina defaulting on its debt uh, in the early in the early 2000s. So that would be an example of a hard default. And our Argentina has unfortunately done it more than once over the past uh, few decades. A soft default is when the government devalues the currency through lots of money printing and then pays you back in full, but it pays you back in dollars or in a currency that is worth less than when you first invested. So if you loaned a government $100,000 in a hard default, you might only get back $50,000 if you're lucky. So that would be a failure to repay principal. In a soft default, you will definitely get back the entire $100,000. But what will happen is in the meantime, the cost of fuel, food, houses, medicine, everything else you need will have gone up so much that your $100,000 will have lost purchasing power. And that's what a soft default looks like. It's usually the route that governments try to take if they can, because a lot of people don't really realize what is happening. And so we're going to talk about what's happening in the U.S. right now. But I'd first like to ask you, if you're enjoying this video and finding it helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button, maybe even share this video with a few friends or colleagues. A lot of people have been asking me, will Russia default on its debt, which would mean, will it miss an interest payment and or fail to pay back principal? And ironically, the answer that to this depends on what the U.S. and the EU decide to do. So the problem is Russia cannot pay back, it cannot pay its euro and U.S. dollar denominated debt. This is, again, U.S. Russian government debt that it issued, issued in various currencies. It, the R Russian government has borrowed in U.S. dollars, it has borrowed in euros, and it's borrowed in rubles. But that euro and U.S. dollar pieces cannot be paid back unless the U.S. and EU unfreeze some of Russia's euro and U.S. dollar reserves, which have been frozen in the banks that they're being held at in Europe and the U.S. Russia obviously cannot print out print new U.S. dollars or print euros to pay off its debts. And so Russia has said that if the EU and the U.S. do not unfreeze its FX assets, its FX reserves, its foreign currency reserves, Russia will be forced to pay off its euro and U.S. dollar denominated debt with, with rubles, which no one wants because they're rapidly being devalued and which it can freely print. So this would definitely constitute a hard default under the terms of 
of most of the, the bonds. You can't borrow money in US dollars and then pay it back in a different currency. That's just not how it works. Fortunately, for the rest of the world at least, Russia only has about $40 billion worth of non-ruble debt as of the end of last year. So not a huge amount of debt. And it looks like as of yesterday, Russia uh, just made a payment on its debt. It sent over $117 million in US, in US dollars in the form of interest payments. And the US Treasury said that it is going to let this payment go through. So, so far it has not defaulted, but it has something like, I believe a $2 billion payment due at the end of April. So we'll see what happens with that, whether the US and the EU give it access to its reserves to make that next payment of interest and or principal. Now, Russian hard default, as I said, is probably not a big deal unless you're a holder of one of those, those bonds. And $40 billion worth of bonds in the scheme of things is not a huge amount of money in terms of global finance. But by contrast, if the US were to do a hard default, this would certainly blow up the global economy instantly. And the reason for that is this, the US government's liabilities, in other words, the money it's borrowed, the US treasuries, its government bonds, are always somebody else's assets. So the government borrows money and this form of borrowing takes the form of a bond which someone holds on their balance sheet or in their account as an asset. And you or I could, could own US treasuries if we wanted to, and a lot of us uh, do own treasuries, uh, usually without even knowing it through a retirement plan. Now there are about $30 trillion worth of US treasuries outstanding. And so a hard default would have a much more severe effect if the US does it versus Russia doing it on just $40 billion worth of bonds. These are many orders of magnitude different. If you have a $100,000 retirement account that is 60% stocks and 40% US treasuries, and the US government does a hard default, you might end up with a retirement account that now has that $60,000 worth of stocks, 60%, and only $20,000 worth of US treasuries post default. This is assuming that the US treasury hard defaults and you only get half of your money back. So instead of having $40,000, you have $20,000 worth of treasuries. This would mean that your entire account value, your entire retirement egg just plummeted from $80,000, just plummeted, I'm sorry, from $100,000 to $80,000. And then it's probably going to be even much lower since if the U.S. were to do a hard default, it would cause a massive crash uh, in, in the U.S. stock market. And so that piece of the portfolio would fall as well. And so this is why a U.S. hard default would be so serious because the U.S. has the, the global reserve currency still and U.S. treasuries and U.S. dollars are used as global reserve assets. You'd have absolute global chaos as assets got, mark, got marked down, and this would trigger more margin calls and liquidations, etc. Now, the U.S. government, a lot of people don't realize this, and it's not, it wasn't a hard default in terms of bonds, but it was a hard default in terms of its monetary obligations. The U.S. government actually did default on August 15th in 1971 when it broke its promise to allow anyone to redeem their U.S. dollars for actual physical gold. This is when Nixon quote unquote, closed the gold window. So this was a very large promise that was broken. The US was forced to do this because it had basically printed too many dollars and there was not enough gold backing those US dollars that had been issued. And so if every holder of US dollars in 1971 had asked for their physical gold in exchange for the US dollars that they held, there would not have been enough gold to go around. And actually France sent a warship to New York in early August 1971 to try to load it up with gold and bring it back to France. And this is one reason Nixon was forced to do this monetary default and say, we're no longer taking those green, uh, we're no longer exchanging green pieces of paper, US dollars for, uh, for physical gold. And this is when the US left the gold standard. This was really the birth of the modern fiat era. Now this, this default happened when the US had a very low debt to GDP level, it's just 35%. Today that debt to GDP level is much, much higher. It's in the, about 123%. The global economy, the US economy are much more financialized and much more levered than they were in 1971. In other words, there's more debt and leverage in the system. And for this reason, a hard default is unthinkable today 
by the U.S. It's also impossible to raise interest rates like Paul Volcker did in the late 70s, early 80s, because the economy is so levered, this would blow up a, a huge number of, of highly leveraged companies, as well as make the debt servicing costs of the U.S. government astronomical. So the U.S. cannot do a hard default, and it cannot raise interest rates a lot. So the only way out really is what's called a soft default, which we, we just spoke about. This is where you pay off U.S. government bonds, you pay off U.S. debts using devalued dollars. Now, how do you devalue the dollar? Basically, you just print a lot of new dollars and you cause inflation. And more inflation increases nominal GDP, which is the productive output of the whole economy in terms of goods and services. And when nominal GDP goes up, it means the whole, whole economy is bigger and is more able to service that level of debt. And as a result, it brings down these debt to GDP levels. The other thing about higher nominal GDP, it means higher tax receipts, which can be used then to service debt. Everyone gets wage increases, the stock market goes up, and this increases tax receipts, which can then be used to service all of that old debt. Right now, the U.S. is running uh, deficits of between two and three trillion, which needs to be monetized by by issuing by issuing more debt. We only bring in four trillion dollars worth of tax revenues, and we're spending close to seven trillion in terms of um, uh, government government spending. And so this is the, the difference that needs to be made up. We can see here the difference between debt to GDP back in 1971 when the U.S. first defaulted. It was about 34, 35%. And now we're much, much higher. We're really at the end of this particular system because of how high the debt levels are. So ironically, in spite of what you hear the Fed say, the Fed actually does want inflation for this reason because it wants to do a soft default and, and, and sort of normalize our debt to GDP levels in this way. It wants to inflate us out of our debt, but without spooking bondholders. And so that's why it has to go through this whole, this whole ruse of saying we're very concerned about inflation, we're raising interest rates, etc. There's a very fine line that they're walking here. They want to inflate us out of our debt, but they also don't want interest rates to spike too much, in which case the Fed would have to step in and do what's called yield curve control and try to control and keep those interest rates lower. Higher GDP due to inflation, as we said, would, call, would create higher tax receipts. And so this is another reason the Fed actually wants inflation. Once the Fed brings debt to GDP levels uh, much lower, back to uh, call it 50, 60, 70 percent, then it would actually be able to raise interest rates and normalize monetary policy without blowing up the economy. So the Fed ultimately does want inflation. Who doesn't want inflation? I would say any politician going into the midterm elections. It's bad for the current administration. It makes them look really bad. Uh, if you're a holder of U.S. Treasuries, basically if you're on any sort of fixed income payments, uh, if you're retired and you have fixed income payments, uh, inflation is very bad for you because there's no real cost of living uh, adjustment quite often, or the cost of living adjustment is not enough to make up for the inflation. Also, inflation is very bad for people who save in U.S. dollars. If you have a lot of cash in your savings account and you're earning just a tiny yield on that, and then inflation is at 7 or 8%, this is obviously disastrous for your purchasing power. Now, hard defaults tend to be highly deflationary and bad for asset prices. This is where, of course, the government doesn't pay back interest or principal. And this is what we're seeing with Russian stock and bond prices. They're already pricing in a hard default as being quite likely. By contrast, soft defaults tend to be highly inflationary and good for asset prices, especially those denominated in the global reserve currency whose sovereign is in the process of a soft, a soft default. So at least nominally, stocks, real estate will go up a lot as the U.S., continues to default on its debt. As we said, the U.S. clearly cannot do a hard default because of the global chaos that it would cause. And the U.S. does not need to do a hard default since it can always print up as many dollars as it needs to. Russia cannot, cannot print up U.S. dollars to pay off its U.S. dollar denominated debt, but the U.S. obviously can print up as much money as it needs to to pay off its debts. Of course, this has inflationary consequences as we've been seeing for the past 12 to 18 months. So what we are experiencing, it's very important to realize this, the U.S. is in the process of defaulting. And it has been really, you might even say, since 2009 when it first started quantitative easing. But we are experiencing a soft default of the global reserve asset 
issuer. The U.S. will never be able to pay off its current debt load. So what it needs to do in this, this sort of shell game that it keeps playing or Ponzi scheme that it keeps playing is it needs to keep issuing new debt to pay off the old debt as it matures. And most of this new debt will need to be bought by the Federal Reserve with newly printed U.S. with newly printed dollars, which is highly inflationary. Foreign buyers of U.S. Treasuries have been largely absent for the past seven or eight years, and we're going to see another reason why they're increasingly absent. A ton of new debt, new U.S. debt, uh, U.S. Treasuries will need to be issued also to pay for all of the Medicare and Social Security benefits as the boomers continue to retire. We're currently seeing U.S. unfunded liabilities. Uh, so social, so social Security is about $22 trillion. Medicare is at $33, $34 trillion. And the total, at least according to U.S. debt clock, total U.S. unfunded liabilities is something like $168 trillion, which sounds a little high to me. I'd, I'd put this closer to $100 trillion. But we have a situation here where we have these unfunded liabilities that may ultimately need to be monetized by the Fed. So what you could see, the Fed's balance sheet is currently uh, close to $9 trillion. You could see the Fed's balance sheet go to $100 trillion, basically go up 10x from where it is right here as the Fed is, need to, is, is required to print money and buy U.S. Treasuries in order to pay for all of this future spending that needs to be done, especially retirement spending for the older generations. And so this, this is how serious the situation is. This is why a lot of countries, very smart countries like China, have stopped buying our debt because they realize how much money is going to need to be printed in the coming decade or so. What we're seeing right now is the first global sovereign debt default that we've experienced since 1971 when the U.S. closed the gold window. But, but today the world is much more interconnected than it was in 1971. Global communication, thanks to the internet, is instantaneous. And so it's much harder to hide these things. When the U.S. defaulted in 1971, it caused various crises. It caused a decade of inflation. But it could have been, it could have been much worse than it was. Today, a default, even a soft default by the U.S., calls into question the entire global financial system because this entire system is built using U.S. Treasuries as the bricks uh, that build the wall, which is the global financial system. And so this is what I mean by uh, the fact that we're experiencing the first global sovereign default in modern history. But it gets even worse because the U.S., as we've been talking about, has just declared that FX reserves held in U.S. dollars are no longer safe or sacrosanct. The U.S. just canceled Russia's FX reserves, as we saw, and basically said said that if you're holding this in banks outside of Russia, we can turn it off, we can freeze it, and we won't even possibly let you use it to make good on your sovereign debt payments that are denominated in euros and in U.S. dollars. And this is not lost on Putin. We just had an announcement from uh, the Russian embassy, Putin saying, uh, the Russian embassy in the U.K., Putin saying that the illegitimate freezing of some of the currency reserves of the Bank of Russia marks the end of reliability of so-called first-class assets. He's talking about U.S. Treasuries here, and to a lesser extent, EU um, government uh, government bonds. And he's basically calling this a default, which, which in many ways it really is if you're going to turn off someone's FX reserves. Now everybody knows that financial reserves can simply be stolen. So this is really, I can't emphasize this enough, what a watershed moment we're experiencing uh, in the last week or so. This is the end of the U.S. dollar and the U.S. treasuries as the global reserve asset. We've been trending in this direction, but now it is finally happening and history is accelerating. If you're a central bank holding a lot of treasuries, you were just given notice that your rights will not be respected and that your FX reserves, especially if they're held in treasuries, can be confiscated or frozen at any time. And as such, if you're a foreign central bank, by which I mean a non-US central bank, you're incentivized to sell those treasuries at the margin, certainly not to buy any more, maybe let them roll off your balance sheet, or, or to even outright sell them as, as Russia has, has been selling their treasuries for the past five years or so. You're incentivized to sell these and replace them with more neutral assets like physical gold and eventually even Bitcoin. And so if foreign central banks are buying fewer treasuries, but the U.S. government still needs to fund itself and fund these huge, um, these huge spending packages and pay for uh, all these retirement benefits, 
guess who has to buy these treasuries? Well, it is the US Federal Reserve, the US Central Bank that's gonna be printing up this money and buying treasuries and monetizing monetizing government spending, which is highly, highly inflationary as we've seen over the past uh, 12 or 18 months. So conclusions, how to invest in US soft default, which is in the process of happening. You definitely wanna avoid US treasuries, you wanna avoid bonds, you wanna avoid holding cash. And again, this is not to, this is not investment advice. And it's not to say you don't want to have a three month emergency fund held in cash. But if you're holding, if you have a significant percentage of your net worth in cash and you're too scared to invest it and you're keeping it in your savings account, you are going to get slaughtered in this soft default uh, just because your your your, uh, your purchasing power will go down very sharply on those US dollars. So you want to avoid bonds of, of all stripes, especially US treasuries, which don't even pay yields that compensate you for the true rate of inflation. You do wanna own stocks, which will be volatile, but will certainly go much higher in the soft default. You wanna own real estate, you wanna own physical gold, and what's even better than physical gold is Bitcoin. It's much easier to store, much easier to send, etc., and it's even much scarcer. If you're a renter, try to buy a house if you can. I hear a lot of people saying this is a housing bubble. I just don't think that's true. What's happening is not so much real estate prices are going up and housing prices are going up in the US. It's more that the purchasing power of the US dollar is plummeting as we're experiencing this soft default. And so really consider, uh, if, you, if you think it's too risky to buy a house, I would I would ask you to reconsider. And I think that if you if you can, this is something that should that should be done. Don't uh, don't expect your rental payments to go down or even to flatline. Rent should continue to go up quite sharply over the next uh, over the next decade. So I'd say the best hedges really are real estate, Bitcoin, and owning your own house, possibly having investment real estate as well. I think Bitcoin though outperforms all of these asset classes by a by a huge uh, margin during this U.S. soft default. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like button. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.